Hi, uh, how are you doing? Yeah, how are you doing? Okay. Well, so when, I guess I haven't actually checked on the quiz when it's um, due. Uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna release it tonight or early tomorrow morning. Um, I just gotta finalize some questions, so it should be due by Sunday. So you have the entire week to work on it. And it's a short quiz. It's not going to be that long. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we will give everybody a few minutes to join us. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Uh, feel a little fine. I'm going through the um, NCL. I'm trying to finish as many questions from the NCL as I as I can. Um, oh, okay. Are you so you're in the NCL? Who's which team are you playing for? Or are you playing by yourself? Right now, it's the individual. Right now, it's the individual portion, the preseason. So the teams has haven't been formed yet. So okay. for now, I'm just trying to see if I can get into like maybe the gold bracket. Oh. I, yeah, I usually most of the time I've managed to to just get to the into into silver. Mm -hmm. but I've once gotten into gold um, that's been my that's usually my goal at least mm -hmm. to try get up there good good for you mm -hmm. yeah I have a group of students that are playing I think Michelle's in this class um she previously played in the California Mayor's Cup yeah we have a, a college division and then I have like three other students. Some of them are pretty beginner. So this is like their first time in the NCL. And then there are a couple of them that this is their second round or more. So we'll see how well they do. So as a coach, I can't give out too much. <laughs> yeah. uh, but at the same time, I can give you some, some, I mean, give them some direction on where to kind of look, but yeah, I see. I see a few of them in the. Um, so and since they have all registered like under the same coach. I'm yeah. So they had um, when we launch a team, uh, we can actually acquire like the the code for a group of students, and then we would release it based on us. You know, so that way it will tie to a coach. So I, I um, because of the California Mayor's Cup, I was able to get the college to give me like four codes. So I opened that up to everybody. And I think four of the students responded. So we were able to get them sign up. Yeah, I see a few, I see a few students who registered in here. I've seen them in the, the, leader, the leaderboard. So they, they seem to be doing fine. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I haven't checked the dashboard because it, it will let me see um, like how well they do. But when they form the team, I don't I can't have access to that. Usually they just they just sign up like and then they they send each other team codes. So if you join a team, basically you communicate with your team members and then the person that starts the team, they will, you know, basically release that code. And that comes with your registration fee for the NCL. Yeah, before it was uh, a separate, was it a separate fee? Yeah, and I, I felt like they they required too much just to, to do the NCL with teams. So um, yeah, so now they put it all combined in one, which is, I think it's fair for the cost this season because if they keep raising the price or changing it with different tier and bracket, it, it they ended they're going to end up having like less people competing. Um, yeah. The difference between the team and the individual is simply just you individual you can't ask for help from anybody else. Right. But teams you basically you, you have at least your team members that you can talk to. So. Yeah, and I think they changed the questions too where it's a little harder in the team versus the individual competition. So if you compete in the team, the problems 
that you have to solve is in, in a larger scale. <clears throat> um, we'll see how well we do. I mean, you know, I want the students to have the experience like you do. Um, and, you know, as far as I'm not, I, I don't push them to rank in a certain way. I just wanted to, them to have fun and learn something. And if we rank high, then that's great. If not, we'll improve next season. And, you know, <laughs> so I'm a pretty lax coach. Some coaches are pretty hardcore. Um, okay. I say more yeah. like the ranking is more like just a, a goal of mm -hmm. where I, I want to try to get to. And okay. with that mindset is like, I once I answer the questions, I know like this is the things that I need to actually go and look up on how to and how to do yeah. and if i can somehow improve that and it gets me to a to a higher position then that means that i've actually learned or yeah. accumulated you know? yeah that's good and it's always good to put ncl on your resume you know because uh, a lot of companies like Radeon, Raytheon, they, they look for that, right? Especially for the security engineers and analysts. So they recruited quite a few people before from NCL. Um, when Cal Poly Pomona used to host it, this is way back when, but now since it's gone virtual and it's gotten really big, um, you know, so you see more companies are looking at the candidates based on the pool. So it's always good to participate in competition like this one. Well, good for you. I'm, I'll root for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to CIS 30B. Um, sorry we missed last Wednesday. I just decided that I know some of you are just still trying to work out some of the assignments. So I just released the review. Um, so let me go into screen share and let's talk about what we need to do this week. Um, so I will release the lab for network automation and security tomorrow. Um, and then for the extra credit game and the quiz, that's probably going to come up tonight. Um, I got back on Saturday and, you know, jet lag and everything else, um, trying to finish some stuff. So, and then along with that, I'll catch up on the grading and catching up on all the meetings that they require. But so um, we get, are going to go over the assignments today. We're going to work a little bit on Python today using Scapy. Um, and then we're going to talk about some of the other libraries and going back a little bit with Ansible. Um, and then for lab six, I'm going to tie the Ansible component with the automation for um, user creation along with um, a little bit of security so that way you can understand how that works using different library and also automation with Ansible. Um, so, and the quiz is going to cover the content that we've gone over in the last four weeks. So, um, whatever you have accomplished in the last four weeks and that kind of reviewed in the assignment. So, you can use your notes um, and your book if you like for the quiz, but for the final exam, it will be closed book and, and closed notes. So um, let's talk about our notes for this week. That's going to be the next chapter, chapter six. And then we're going to go over the assignments. Um, and in the assignments this week, we are going to work on a little bit on scripting. Um, kind of remove from what we've been doing the last two weeks, and then we will talk a little bit about Ansible. Okay, so let me, hold on one second. Let me zoom in on Word. And I'm definitely thankful to be back in California where it's nice and warm, you know? <laughs> so, okay. So here is the notes and you can download this. Um, yeah, you can, thank you, Cynthia. Cynthia. Uh, you can download it from Canvas. So we'll start with talking about Scapey. And 
the way the author uh, started the chapter is talking about the lab setup. Um, he mainly uses viral, but you can definitely use a Linux Ubuntu machine uh, or multiple virtual machines to test this type of script. Uh, and Scapy is pretty cool. Um, if you get more in depth in security and network assessment, or even looking at pen testing, Scapy is one of the main library that you often touch on. So it is a powerful tool uh, or a library. It allows you to work with the packets, um, especially when you're scanning for ports, when you're looking for protocols, when you are working with specific protocol like ICMP, ARP, et cetera. So here it talks about how Scapy can forge and decode packets um, with different protocols. And in the umbrella of a user datagram protocol, UDP, or TCP and other additional protocol, but most protocol will fall under those two categories. Um, <clears throat> so it, wh whatever that you have used in the past for networks monitoring tool like Wireshark, um, you know, Netacat, all, all those type of tool can be implemented into script um, using Scapy pretty much. So, here it talks about how it would handle scanning tasks. Um, if you want to trace route where we can follow a packet from source to destination, um, we can look at probing. And keep in mind that um, in pen testing, some, some of the tools, the majority of the tools are non-passive, meaning that it's invasive, meaning that it would also call home. Um, it would let the host know that who you are and, and what type of addresses. So in some cases, they would have to spoof in order to really uh, mask their original or their, their real address. Um, so when, when we talk about probing, sometimes we, most of the time we would refer to invasive probing, um, non-passive. And if you're looking at Wireshark, Wireshark is pretty passive. Um, most of the common network monitoring tool like scanner, sniffer, um, they tend to be very passive. But when you're looking at like Nmap, um, when you're looking for ports, when you're looking for vulnerabilities, when you're looking for, you know, holes to get into a specific system or a part of the network, um, that tends to be non-passive. So um, it would let other systems that you connected to know who you are and so therefore you know using spoofing tool in the case of an attacker would be you know an addition component to the process um, so now from a network networking and administrator standpoint why would we use these um, we would use them to really monitor and check the status and the health of our systems and network. Um, we want to be able to test and make sure that our network can withstand some of the probing or the issues that will come um, into and internally exist inside the network. So here it talks about how you can handle some of the tasks using this library or this module. Um, you can also change and, and do frame injection, especially when you work with wireless. Um, that will be the third bullet, 802.11 frames. And then looking at our cache poisoning, that's a common approach in the case where if you want to um, mask the identification or change or, you know, doing additional attack. Um, and then for the voice over IP, most of the time you're gonna see that voice over IP is being used with switches. So, and that uses web encryption. So in some cases you would have to use additional tool to break the encryption. But for this, it allows you to decode the voice over IP traffic. Um, and so, Scapy is one of those tools that allows you to be incorporated with your script. Um, and in it, it has some of the functionality that would be very useful for the security side. And as you know, that security entails 
90% networking. So if you want to be better in security, you have to really understand protocols, ports, and et cetera. Now, from a de developer standpoint, right, the applications that you see um, that would be interfacing devices um, and the application that you would see from, you know, like even in Kali tool sets, um, those are written by people, mostly developer that created these tools. So you can utilize this type of library to build your script. Um, so let's talk about the assignment. Give me one second. So for the first question, it asks you, what is the purpose of Python Scapy? So Scapy um, works with version 2.7 and version 3.8. Um, you know, or even prior to 3.8. Um, in the notes, I provided um, an image of that. So it has changed over time. And you can refer to page one of your notes. Um, I basically just copy the information over. So it allows you to force and decode packets with different protocols. Um, you're able to capture packets. So when we scan, we're able to see the packets and you can actually access each of the packet. Now in different type of attack, like especially with the wireless side, we would look at initialization vector in the packet, especially for when it's coming from a certain source going into a certain destination. Um, and there are tools like Cola and other tools that would be able to, you, to be used with the packet to change the content of the packet. So if you're able to write your script, you're capable of doing the same thing as some of these tools that exist. You can use it to trace route, to scan, to probe, to test unit, and for network discovery. So from an attacker standpoint, the first thing that they usually do is to scan, scan against the system, scan against the network, trying to see what's happening. So um, my analogy for it is when you, when a person's trying to, let's say, rob a bank, they wanted to study the blueprint of the bank, right? They wanted to see the guards, what time the guards are leaving, coming, who's there, um, what kind of security is in place, et cetera. So network discovery from an attacker standpoint is a very important area um, that before they start going in depth with different attack, they have to learn about the network, okay? And then with, with this type of tool, it can be used for tasks, um, especially with injection for frames. And then we touch a little bit on virtual local area network um, in that we would set up a virtual network that be isolated from our regular network. And we can set up segment on those network to for specific things, right? Um, for purpose of access, um, for purpose of protection of our data. So with this, this allows us to look at VLAN hopping um, using cache poisoning. But the main advantage is it allows you to craft your own packet at the very basic level. So we're gonna take a look at some of the script on how to scan, how to look at ports, okay. So, this content came from page one of your notes and suggested that we wanted to look at the guide for how to get started and walk you through how to set up, like doing the installation. And then you can simply import in Escapee to be able to utilize it with your script. So as far as crafting packet sources and destination server, so that means that you would have to install Scapy on the client 
in order for that client system to understand the script, to be there's your script to be interpreted that by that client system. And so from an attacker standpoint, how would they be able to do that, right? Um, they can embed, right, um, the, the installation process into maybe a Trojan or mask it with something for the user to download, click the link and be able to run it. So there are many tactics um, and they would sometime incorporate social engineering, right? You can, uh, from an attacker standpoint, they can contact the user, trick them into installing. Um, but if we do test it from an administrator standpoint, you simply need to install that on the client along with the server. So now to install, this is an example of that. Um, and it's coming from the GitHub. I mean, the Git clone. So this is the GitHub site. Um, and then once you are, once you obtain it, you can then use sudo. And here we want to specify which Python version. Then you can do the install. So for the next question, again, you can refer to page one of your notes. So in terminal, how do you install Python's KP? We would issue the command git clone https github.com secdev scapy.git. Now, if you go to the link, the documentation of uh, Scapy, you, you will find a button um, that shows how you can download it. Let me see if I can find this. Sorry. One second. It just hides all my So this is the documentation <clears throat> page and you can find the download here. So if you wanted to look at the compatibility, you can use this on Windows. You're capable of running it on Linux and Mac OS. Um, and then along with Unisys, if you're looking at the older systems like older servers, okay. And then you want to check out how to install. Um, now, this is the shell demo for the code, but you can go down further and it actually gives you additional tutorial information, installation page, building network tools. Um, the people who are really successful in security as far as pen tester and ethical hacker and blue team, red team, purple team people, right? Um, those are the people who are capable of writing their own tools. Um, and, you know, even in assessment for applications, if you're capable of writing your own tools instead of using other people's tool, you can customize it to the type of system that you're working with. So it's very helpful to understand scripting and writing the program um, so you can create your own tools. So on this page, it shows you some of the details about Scapy um, and the project, but you will find the link for download and the, the guide for, in, for getting started. Okay, so <clears throat> once we have set up with Git, then we can change our directory to Scapy. And then here we would then do the sudo python setup install. And this is just from the Linux side, okay? So from the Windows, it's gonna be slightly different. Now, so that would be the first step that you need to do in order to, to use this module. 
you got to get it installed and then you can import, okay? Because if you don't have it installed, you cannot import it. So after you do the installation, you can run it from shell. So once you install, you simply do sudo scapey and it's gonna open up the shell and you can issue directly into the shell. So very similar to what you've seen with idle or you know other form of shell, this particular module has its own shell. So you can run it from the shell. So now here, this shows you how you can look at the import to see if you can import it successfully, okay? So you can do from scapey that all import or you can do import scapey and then do the asterisk. Very similar to what we've seen when you work with module in CIS 38. And then exit would just let you exit out of that. Okay. Now in the following area on part on page two of your notes, it talks about ICMP. And I think we touch on this in the, in the in a couple of weeks before. Um, so when you ping a system, you can use the ping command in terminal or in command prompt for Windows to communicate with a system to check to see if it's connected. And ping uses ICMP. So what it does is it sends these request packets. And if you work, if you use the Windows environment, it's going to send four requests and it's going to wait for the destination system. So if I ping, right, 10.0.0.9, what it's, what it's going to do is going to try to send four packets to this destination address. And if that system is connected and able to receive ICMP requests, then it's gonna respond, right? So for Windows system, that will be four packets sent, four packets reply. In Linux systems, if you don't do the count, it's gonna keep pinging. Now, you know, in the form of attack, like ping of death or smurf attack, um, you, you know, some people call that in other terms, but you can ping someone or some system for a long time and it will just be so occupied that it has to keep replying, right? So in some cases, administrator would disable this particular service um, and they can filter that, right? They can use it internally, but not allow ping externally, um, et cetera, okay? So in this example, it shows you how you can create a script to, send uh, a, the ICMP packet to a certain system. Now, when we look at the output, we also need to take a look at both sides, right? We can look at the output from the source, which is the server that's going to send to the client, which is the, 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 the destination. So when you see the request that's coming from the source, and when you look at the reply, that's coming from the destination, okay? So when you look at these, you have to look at it from both sides. So from the client side, you can say send, and then the IP, you can simply declare your IP address in the quotation mark. So your destination DST here is gonna be equal to, and put the IP address. Then you can put in the protocol, which ties it to the service. So ICMP, and this send function simply is gonna send the packet. So in the next question, it asks you to write the script to send ICMP packet from a Linux client system to a server, 
10.0.0.12 using scapey send function or method. So first you have to, in terminal, you have to do super user do scapey. Okay. And then we are gonna issue a send and inside the send, the parameter, we wanted to put IP and we would then pass the IP parameter. DST and then put in the IP address, make sure it's in quotation marks. Then we're gonna do a slash and we wanted to specify the protocol ICMP. Now, since we're using the module what it's going to do is going to refer to the definition of send method in that module. And it's going to plug that in. So whatever the destination of your system that you're trying to paint, or you're trying to send that ICMP packet to, then you will put in the IP there. Okay. So this allow us to utilize shell directly and be able to have the packet sent. Now, why, why do we care of writing like this when we just can just ping, right? Um, in the case where if you want to write tools to be able to ping 100 systems at once, you can do that. And what you can do is you can create a, a, a dot .py program, right, a file, and then you can use Ansible to run that, right? And it will just execute the task. So you can set up the automation process um, instead of just, you know, issuing each of, the, each of the actual script to the shell every single time. So what we can do is we can create our own module, our own file, and then by importing in the scapey module and then be able to automate some of this, okay? Now, ping is very useful, like I said, to check to see if the system is connected, it's able to respond. Um, so you can, you can do it this way. Any question? Okay. Now send is the, not the only method that we can use from this module. And so here it shows you a little bit of the output, right? Now on the server side, you see how, how this is done. You would use TCP dump and you can specify the connection interface. So you, when you see F1 here, that's basically the ethernet connection point that's labeled as ether one. So now with the TCP dump, if you use robots output, then it can show the details, okay? So if now it's, useful if we're able to see it on both sides because we're trying to ping the server we wanted to see you know what was sent and how it's responding okay all right so you can also do um, a send request function and in this case, we're gonna use something called SR. So what we're doing here in this example, if you're looking at like using SR function example, we create an object called P and we simply use the send request method very similar to send, the parameter of this is you're gonna put in IP, and then you want to specify your IP address in quotation mark, 
you want to declare that inside IP there and then also the service. Now, when you use the send request function, you would see that it's going to give you a tuple as an output. So in order to really see the content of that, because when it finished sending packet, right, and it will tell you like, oh, yeah, it sends like this many packets and it received this answer. We wanted to really see the content of that because what's good is it, right? We, we wanted to see if it was successful, you know, what kind of details. So when you're using type here, all that is, it is gonna tell you the type that is you to, to but it's return from that particular, that particular script. So here it tell you that it's a tuple that's gonna be returned. So basically, what we wanted to do is we wanted to see, so when you only issue the type, it's only gonna list, right? Where is that list? And what type, of, what type is it gonna be categorized under? So since it's a tuple, we have to, and tuple is just a static list, right? It's unchangeable because it's gonna be used as output so it's not going to use the regular list. It's going to use a tuple. So what you can do is you can implement a for loop. And you can say that for i in, right, whatever that object that you previously declared, right, for the both the client and the server, then you can print out, okay, the content inside that tuple, okay? And it would give you the details like, um, you know, fragmentation versions, you know, how many times it attempts it, what kind of reply. So you, you will see the echo reply. Okay, so let's try. For number four, it asks you to write a script to send ICMP packet from a Linux client system to the server 10.0.0.12 using scapey send request function SR, then print the content of the request and response of the client and the server. So we first would start with declaring, right? Just like what we did earlier, okay, with the, with the send, but in this case, we have two objects. We have the server and the client, and you can name it anything you want. A, B, C, F, right? Most people, they would use like a single letter for the object, however you wanted to name that. Then you would have the send request method. And here we would state our IP and we would define our the parameter for the IP. So 10.0.0.12, like what it's asked here. And that will be ICMP. Now, at this point, if you do the type, right? If I add in like type serve, it's only going to give me what that list is called, OK? So what we need to do is we need to print the content from that from that tuple okay so we would then do for i insert print i make sure we indent there so that will take care of this object then for the client we then would do for j in client print j Okay, and I put a comment, use print type to see the tuple details. And if you wanted to see the tuple details, then you can do the print type. <clears throat> okay, any question? 
So this is super simple, nothing complex, right? We simply are looking at the source and the destination and how each would have requests and replies. So the detail for your packets that you in initiated with ICMP. So later on, we will put together one complete program for you know, scanning purposes or monitoring purposes. And we can make it where it's generalized so we can reuse it over time. Questions? And we do have, we do have, um, we do have a, a class that's specifically focused on security where it goes more in depth into using Python for security tools. Um, but this is because it ties back to networking and monitoring your network. So you have a pretty light question. Sorry, I had, uh, I've been having intermittent internet connection. Okay. Um, did you, um, can you have more than one client or do, would you loop through a client to have can, more than one client? Yeah, so what you can do is you, you can set up a list of client and then you would loop through them. So you would nest the loop for that list. Like, you know, if I have client and I would set that up as a list, so I would have to declare that first. And then I would I would loop through each, like I would use index for each of the client and then loop through that. Sure, you can do that. That way you don't have to issue it multiple times, but what you can also do is you can write a general module and then use Ansible to just test it through however many clients, because all you have to do is to create the configuration side of your group, right? Last week we talked about that where you would have a group and then you would list all the IP addresses of those clients. And then when you run the, when, when you run, you, when you run that playbook, you just run that playbook with the module file. And so however that you would feel, I, I would do the Ansible because that way I can reuse my module versus, and then you can always rewrite your configuration file, um, your inventory file to have a different list of clients. So, so I might've missed what you said when you, what does um, the 4J and client, what is that looping through? So the, there are two, there's a source and there's a destination, right? The server is our destination and the client is our source. So when you ping, right, it usually show two things. It shows the echo request and the echo reply. So what happens is it store those in separate, separate tuple. Like the status of how the server, which is your destination, is replying and the client is how it's, you know, what it's requesting. So like, um, let me show you. So so when we do like a ping, a regular ping like this, right? Um, it's actually, I'm pinging myself, but I'm actually, it's the source and the destination is the same. So what you see is you see the echo reply from that, that destination system, right? And it tells me the detail for the pain. So on the server side, your destination side, this is what you're gonna get in that tuple. 
Okay. Oh, so for the, the J is each each ping. Right. So when you loop through it, it's gonna it's gonna because it doesn't always we when we send packets, right? This one for Windows system, it usually it it keeps it at four. That's that, that's on like the OS side seeing that command. But on Linux systems and other systems, it can you can have it count, you can have it continuous. Yeah, so it will have to loop through in order to store because what happens is when it creates that tuple, it's going to store each each of the re reply as in an index in that tuple. Okay. So. Yeah, welcome. So now when we use this, you should know that we're using layer three and up. So when we deal with IP addresses, most of the time it's routing and up, right? Um, even though some switch can handle routing. So in this particular chapter, we're addressing layer three and four or even higher like layer seven. Excuse me. So now we can also use it for DNF lookup, right? And in Windows, you can, you know, you often see like NS lookup like this, okay? And then it will tell me like my default server. So, but in the Linux environment, we would, we can look up and in any command line, actually, you can look up uh, DNS. Okay, and when we look at DNS, all all the domains out there, they're registered and they would have like an, you know, they would they would have some form of open DNS. And so in this, what we can do is we can use Scapy to query DNS. The majority of the DNS out there uses DNSSEC, which is using DNS security which is better because if you use regular DNS, potentially your records can be modified, right? Um, and I addressed this in my CS27 class and maybe I mentioned it in other class, but what you can do is you can query for the DNS server and in the example that they show here is it's simply querying DNS, the open DNS server for google.com. So let me go into, sorry, I keep having to stop share, but give me, show, let me show you a link where you can find that. So what if you wanted to know, right? There's a tool online and Google public DNS, it, it will allow you to resolve. So all DNS servers is tied to an IP address, right? And so if we're looking at simply like youtube.com and if you, you're curious, you can do like dns.google.com and then it will take you to, you know, a page where you can query. And I wanted to check this out first before I start using, because what if you don't know the DNS address, right? What if you don't know the, the, the actual address for youtube.com, okay? because in our browser now, it doesn't, the old browser it used to show you the actual public IP address of it, but now they don't do that anymore. So when you communicate with youtube.com, it's actually connecting you to the open Vienna server. And using this tool, we can see what that is. So we would see that here it tells us specific role that particular server is entailing, right? If it's true, then it's gonna hold that, okay? Now for the youtube.com, this is the name that we see that we use in our browser. But when it resolves that, it resolves it to this address. Okay. 
and then you can directly resolve it. So when you're using Scapy, what you're doing is you can query a domain name server with the, with the URL, or you can do it with an address, okay? So the example that it shows here is that they use google.com, but you still have to specify the address, okay? Now, why is that NS lookup important? Sometimes when you have a client that's connecting to that domain and um, it's not resolving, you know, like it can't, cannot connect to that domain because it's not resolving the DNS for some reason. You can then flush it, right? And then you can try to query it again. Possibly that it, you know, a lot of the times it, it comes in as if there you that system that's trying to connect to the DNS, if it's using the wrong IP address that doesn't belong to the subnet of, of that particular domain and the router is not able to forward the route to that domain name system, okay? So, and in some cases we, we would use it for troubleshooting, but in the case where if you just wanted to look at the server resolution, you can simply use that, right? And we can do NS lookup of, you know, www.google.com. So now what you can see is In the next exercise, we're going to look at how we would be able to write the script to resolve the YouTube.com. So write the script to query DNS YouTube.com, right? And you saw the IP address is 142.250.72.238 using Scapy. So first, you're simply going to declare an object. We call that F. You can call it anything you want. We would do an SR or an SR1. And then the IP, so you would specify its IP. And this would be under UDP. Then here, you saw earlier in the site that we would have all, almost all DNS, we would have the RDS1. So here for our query, we wanted to do a DNS query and the name that we're trying to resolve is www.youtube.com, okay? And then after you run this in the shell, then you can simply issue F again because you already declare it, then it's gonna output the details for that resolution. Okay, just like how we see as the tool. So what you see on the website, somebody wrote the code for that, right? It's just a tool to look up DNS information and all the DNS that exists that you see on the internet is has some form of open DNS information. And in the case where people use surveillance camera, right? Some, some of the surveillance camera technology uses open DNS. You have to connect to those open DNS. And if that open DNS is not protected, you can actually see people's footages. They are a little bit better at protecting that now, but you know it depends on the type of service that you're using or the technology that you're using. Many of them uses that. That's why you see like people use like um, you know images from you know Ring or recorded stuff because it's publicly available on some of them. And you you agree to the term and the agreement for those surveillance footages to be implement it with that open DNS. And if that open DNS is widely open, then all the images are seen. So this is why you have to be careful with putting surveillance system inside your home if you're using open DNS. And how secure is it on the cloud? It's a question, right? 
Okay. Questions? Yeah, you mentioned um, last year how somebody hacked into your camera at home. Yep, yeah, I did. And I spoke <laughs> from personal experience. I had Nile a uh, surveillance camera. And, you know, I pulled the system as soon as I found out. But yeah, they were, um, they were injecting. Um, they were trying to um, obtain my password and how they funnel into my system was through the open DNS um, sources that I was using because that particular technology is tied to, you know, like a certain um, open DNS. They recommend certain, you know, they give us a set of DNS to use. And then on it, you would, you would set up where you would then connect your home system to that and your home system has an IP address. So they just follow the breadcrumbs and that's how they got to my system. So when I went into the administrative um, console, I saw that there were like scripts that they used to trying to um, get, you know, to brute force my password. Um, because I had it password protected, but I didn't use it internally inside my house. It was just for the parameter. And yeah, we pulled it. Um, now I use a different type of system, but the app-based systems now, you know, still it's not a hundred percent safe. It's never a hundred percent safe. So you have to take a risk either way. Okay. Any question with DNS query? Okay, so here what you see is you see how that's used example on page three. Now, what if you wanted to capture packets like Wireshark, right? You wanted to use it as a sniffer. So it has a built-in sniff function or method. And then it also, you can implement the filter mechanism where you can filter out certain protocol and you can make it where it would only include so many, right? Like here we would have the five and notice that for the ICMP, you have one request, one echo reply, another echo request, another echo reply and so on. So when you run Wireshark, if you click you know, you type in the filter criteria ICMP, you would get this, right? And then you can have it stored or display so many. So this allows you to do the same thing using this particular module. So here, basically we define an object and in that we would use sniff method. We would set our filter then you would put in the protocol that you want to filter in the quotation mark. And then you can set the count, right? If you want more, you can just change this number to a higher value. After that, you can just simply use the show method and it's going to show you the details in the capture. Now, if we don't do the count, it might give you a flush of a lot, right? It could be a lot. So, in the case, if we are looking at HTTP, if everybody on the network is using HTTP, it's going to give you hundreds, okay? So what you want to do is, you know, if you're looking for abnormal, you know, traffic, you can filter out that particular type of traffic, and then you can skim down the number and you can chunk it. So that way it's not a lot, right? So we can look at the first 50, and then we can look at the next 50. So, or you can look at everything, but then you have to comb through it. And then, you know, but you can export that out as a file and then be able to manage it. Um, but this gives you the overall details about the raw. So this gives you the raw packet information. And then you can go in and take a look at each of the packets. So if the first one is suspicious, then what I can do is I can evaluate that packet, right? But from an attacker standpoint, they're going to try to grab some packets and then they will modify the packet and inject their information in there, poison it, and then 
be able to intercept your traffic. Right. And with that, they can do like, you know, that's man in the middle poisoning. There are a lot of like different tactics that they can use, like I mentioned, but usually, you know, capturing packets, what good does that do, right? From an attacker standpoint, they would use that for intercepting your information, right? Um, impersonating you. And that's, that's the whole point in capturing packets. From a protector standpoint, the security specialist or the, the professional, then what we can do is we can study our traffic and we can see what's vulnerable in our network area, right? What kind of traffic that we're generating and possible way to kind of block or control certain systems and reroute certain systems, okay? So here it shows you how that's done. And then you can, you can also implement a loop for it to kind of show the packet details, each one of them. So if I put in a for loop, for, for packet in A, which is A defined here, print packet dot show. So what I can do is I can print individual packet for the five that I captured. Okay, so you can follow it up with the for loop and then be able to see the details. So in the next question, we want to write a script and we want to capture maybe five HTTP packets, then we want to display the packet details. Okay. So in the first part, I have M and then we're gonna use sniff. We can filter HTTP and that's port 80, right? Then we can do a count and you can count however many that you wish. I didn't specify there. After that, we would be able to show, so it's gonna show our capture in raw after the second line. Then next, what it's, we're gonna do is we can implement a for loop. And you can call for i in m, right? But I just follow the example in the book so it's close to it so you can reference. For packet in m, indent and then we wanted to print packet dot show so at this point it's going to print out the details for each of the packet like if if on wireshark if you double click a packet and it's going to show you know check some all of the details about that packet okay so simply we can achieve that in four lines Any question with packet capture with scaping? And some of these tools exist is because of libraries like these, right? So now you can see the resources that you can use for the tools in security or networking. Okay. So this is on page four, right? I took a snapshot of that. Um, so when you look at the packet, it tells you Okay, this is the MAC address of the source and the destination, what type, the protocol, the length, the flags, you know, same details that you would see in Wireshark. Just Wireshark has the graphical user interface, right? That makes, that allows you to click and, you know, use the buttons and type in the search, et cetera. But in the back, you would see something like this. If you ever run Wireshark in terminal, right, it would look like this. Okay. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about TCP port scanning. Question? Yes. 
Why would you run Wireshark in the terminal? Uh, because I don't know. <laughs> I've always used it. Oh, okay. If you run <laughs> Kali and you don't, you can't install it. Kali has it built in. So there are Linux OSs for pen testing that already has it built in, and the built-in tool that they have is non-graphical user interface because when it was first written, it's non-graphical user interface. But Wireshark, it, the, the perks of it is to use a graphical user interface to make it easier on you. But what if you have a Linux system that you can't install a graphical user interface application, just run everything in terminal. So yes, <laughs> options there. Okay. Yeah, because if you have 30,000 packets, I, I can't imagine using Oh yeah, okay. but but then you would just pull, you would just get the capture file and then use log analysis or something to filter it, right? Or some other tool to filter it. And that's how they got around with, with you know, looking at, you know, instead of skimming through and looking at thousands and thousands of packets, they just do a search, you know, criteria, use that type of tool just to look through it and be able to analyze it. Um, so yeah, you will have to incorporate other tools to make your life a little easier. Otherwise you pull your hair out, but okay. Yeah, I, I, like, I like some of the tools for the fact that it has like all the buttons and stuff ready for you instead of, but if you use Wireshark or uh, Nmap or Zenmap, you notice that you can actually add in the script. So when you, when you click on something, it, it shows you the command of it, right? So in the back, it is really this. All right, so next we're gonna talk about something that will be parallel to Nmap. Um, port scanning is very important in security, right? Like I tell my student, if you don't remember anything, if you can remember one thing, one most important thing is to disable your ports, right? <laughs> um, is that unused ports needs to be disabled. And that's what attackers look for. They look for ports that are enabled, ports that, you know, that they can capitalize on. So here it talks about how port scanning is important and um, what we can do with Scapy when we wanted to scan port. So earlier we mentioned that every protocol ties to a port ID or a port number, okay? And most of the time we would see technology that's you know, out of the box, they use common ports. And so what happens is we would have tools to scan for ports, things like ZenMap or NMap, those are the tools that will go look for the operating system, the type of ports it's using, you know, ways that, you know, to prevent attacker from getting in, but from an attacker standpoint, that's how they're able to find ways to get in. So here is an example that it's gonna look for Telnet and don't ever enable Telnet um, on the more modern system because Telnet is very vulnerable. It has a flaw, so don't use Telnet. You can use SSH, but SSH is also now becoming, you know, more of an issue um, in this current year. So, okay. So here is an example. We have an object, and again, we're using the send request method. We simply state the destination system IP, and then here we would specify the port. So. Um, no matter what port that you use, this S port is always gonna be 666. And I don't know if there's symbolism in the triple six, I'm not gonna read further into it, right? Um, but for the destination port, what you have is you would specify the service port, which is 23 for Telnet, okay? So here, when you issue that, what will happen is it's gonna tell you that there are packets information and how it's responding, okay? But if you wanted to do the P 
p.show, which is the object that you name is p, and then you issue the show method with it, then what you will be able to find is you will find packet information that would contain port details, okay? So earlier, what we did was we only issue with the protocol, right? With the IP, it didn't, we didn't specify the port. So if you add in the port information, you can actually see the details of that port, okay? So here it tells us that this is Telnet, right? And then, um, and it also shows, you know, time to live, the type, the, the, the category of the protocol, the checksum information, the source, the destination, some of the details about that packet, okay? Now, on the next one, it shows you how you can use list to check for the port from the server side, okay? Now, if we wanted to check the port 22 instead of 23, and 22 is SSH, right? So we simply replace that with that 22, and then it's gonna also be able to give us the details, right? SSH, that's the, the name, right? Uh, for the protocol that's used with that particular port, source destination, the acknowledgement, and so on. Okay. So now in the next question, it asks you to write the script to scan port 23, which is telnet of a server 10.0.0.12 to display its response using Scapy. So I have an object called scan, you call scan one, S one, whatever you like, right? And we're using send requests. IP, we simply put in the 10.0.0.12. And knowing that the telnet will be under TCP, so we would do TCP. The S port is going to be 666. Your D port is the port that you're trying to find, 23. And then your flags is S for set. Then after that, we can do the dot show. Okay, yeah, no problem, Chris. So we would then do the dot show. Okay. And with that, if you reference back over here, once you do the dot show, it's gonna give you the details in, in the shell but we can also do right scan dot show so you can do it two ways in this one it shows you okay so you can have it this way or you can have it this this other way okay so another option that we can do is would be Scan dot show. Just simply just call show method there. So you're accessing that method using that object, right? So this allows us to scan for port 23, which is Telnet on this server. Now, most of the time they would disable that service, right? They would disable Telnet. So you would receive that it's disabled. Okay. Now we can also do it with the range. What if we kind of suspect that they might have one of the ports open, right? Between a certain number, we can have it scripted 
to check for the ports that are open. Since it's a group, right, that belongs to a list or a tuple, then what we can do is we can implement the for loop. Okay. So what I have is I have the server and the client. And then I'm using the send request method for number eight. The IP, I would put in the IP address for the target. And since I'm looking for TCP ports between 20 to 23, okay, those are the common ports, right? We would do TCP here, and then the S port would be 666. Our D port, instead of using one port number, you wanted to specify where you want to start and where you want to finish there in the parameter. Okay. I'm sorry, this should be 23. I don't know why I type in 22. And then the flags. Because it's a group, we want to be able to use a, a for loop. And now in this one, I'm printing the server information, right? So if I wanted to print the client, I can have another for loop. I can say for J in C, print J. So even with this, we can write it as a general module, right? And then use that module, like I said before, with Ansible, and then have Ansible execute the .py file as a task for each of the targeted system. So if you have like 10,000 systems, what you can do is you can create an inventory file, which is a group, Right, which has a group and then pass that group name in the task execution using Ansible. But when you run the Ansible playbook, you just call on that module file, the .py file that you created for scanning ports. Okay. So you can automate all of that in like, you know, one shot because from an attacker standpoint, they have a very small window for most part, right? Time is of essence. They have time to research, but you know, once they put together the research result, they might say that, okay, I have between this time and this time to kind of look, or this time, this time to attack, okay? Any question with question eight? So this is kind of fun if you start practicing, right? You can fire up your Linux um, virtual machine and then you can try it out. You first install Scapy and then you can import Scapy or open and use its shell and then be able to execute it in its shell. Okay. So now we're gonna move on to the next part. Okay. So here's the example that the same thing, similar to what we've seen. So the output of that, as you can see, it's going to give you the details um, from the scan when it loops through. So when you put it together as a, a Python file, right? You would then start with an import statement. And here we would we would say from scapy.all import asterisk. 
Now, if you do import scapey asterisk, right, it, it, would, it would just import everything from scapey. So you can use it this way, or you can go like the traditional way. And on this one, we would do an import sys. And down here, it talks about how we would use sys information if you've done like the, the um, error handling before, exception handling, you've dealt with sys module before, okay? So here it's because we're using scapey, we import it in and the sys module for taking in arguments. So we wanted to use some of the arguments um, that's gonna come from the sys modules, as you can see on this line right here, right? So we, and then this line right here in the arguments. So that's why we have to import in the dot sys. Okay. Then in the middle here, we, we define two functions. Okay. The first one is where we would do the scan. Okay. And then that will be our destination and our port. And then like what we've been practicing, right? We would put in the send request, and we would declare our object send request IP. And here we use destination instead of the exact IP because we wanted to be able to plug that in as we go, right? We wanted to make a module that's very general that's gonna plug in different IPs down the line. And then again with the port information, okay? Then we would have a for loop. So we would say for sending return in, right? And this is gonna be their, uh, the server. With the if else statement, we basically want to check for specific flags and it's gonna return port details that will be only be open and not open. So. When you scan, you wanted to see what's open and what's not open, and that's gonna plug it in, right? We wanted to categorize it so it's easier for us to find the, the information. In this one, I, I didn't like the way that he, he defined main here because it's not a good practice in programming to do that. But anyway, we, because main is built in, we're gonna call on main here, but here is defining main. So here's where you do the decoration. Think of it as your main function in most program, right? Destination, we're gonna use the, for the argument with sys and then your port. We want it as an integer because that's gonna be the number. And then your scan result, that's gonna give you the, it's gonna scan the destination system for port and it's gonna print the scan result. But lastly, you have to have, you have to enter the main. So you have to say if namespace, that name is main, then you're gonna call main, okay? So here it tells you that, that each of the areas where it talks about TCP scan, that we wanted to use the TP, TCP scan function in the main, right? You wanted to call it because that's why you define it in the first place, okay? So this is like a general, general program that you can write and then the output of that. So once you write it, you can do sudo Python and then you know, put down the name of the Python file. And then you would, because it's general, you have to specify the IP address and the port that you're looking for. So in this case, we're looking for port 22, which is SSH and port 80, which is HTTP, okay? So you can definitely create a, a templated module and then be able to specify what you want in the shell when you run it. Okay, and then this would give you the details, but if you 
if you wanted to get into it further, then you have to add in how you want it to display the data. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about how to ping, <clears throat> how to do all different pings. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of times, sometimes, you know, we have ICMP disabled or in some system, it doesn't use ICMP. It might use a different protocol under these two categories, right? TCP and UDP. So we can do pings, right? Using ICMP or under the, the two protocols, okay? So when we write this, just like the other one, we need to import the component from Scapy. And we would then need to specify or define our method, okay? And the destination, we're gonna plug that IP in later. We would have our server and our client system. And then we would do a send request, IP, destination, ICMP. So this method is for ICMP ping, okay? This method right here on page seven is for port scanning. And then the below method is for UDP ping, the third one. Okay, the difference between this is again, like our name, right? The name are two different things, but the, the real difference is gonna be the protocol that you specify here and on the UDP, if you wanted to, you know, you can set your D port is gonna be zero. Okay, so T ICMP uses TCP, so that takes care of the TCP one. This takes care of the UDP ping. And then this is going to address the port ping. Okay. Then we want another method to make sure that we have answers or results, right? We want it to print it. So because all of these are going to be in some kind of larger container, we wanted to use a for loop. So for send and receive in, right, the server or our destination system, we're gonna print receive. Now, if you wanted to print send, you can issue another print line, but print receive. And then we wanted to print IP source is a lot. So refer to this example for the next question. Um, I have it written actually using that example. Let me move this onto the next page so you can see it together. Okay. So like we said, we have the import statement we define the ICMP function, okay? And we use the send request method here. And you can call this anything you want, but make sure you keep it uniform so it's easy for you to identify which system that is. Then we're gonna return from that function or that method. Then we're gonna do the port ping define that method. Then we're gonna declare the two objects. That's gonna be for port scan, return from that method. Then we're gonna do a UDP ping. This one, we're again gonna declare the method, I mean the object, and we are gonna use UDP return from that method. Then we're gonna have 
another method for our answer file. And then we want to iterate through it to look at the receive information. After that, we would have the main <clears throat> where we would then print then and here is where we plug in the range of IP. Okay. So if you wanted to ping 10.0.0.13 to 14, you can do that. So we can execute that. We can <clears throat> we can call on that method and it's going to execute that ping for these systems, right? These two 10.0.0.13 through 14. And then it's going to give us, we're going to call on the answer summary method to show that. And then we're going to print the next one to show a different ping now. Then we're going to do a TCP ping. Again, call on the answer summary method. And then after that, we would do a UDP ping. Again, we were to print to print from the range. Now the difference between the port ping and the, the TCP or the UDP ping is that the port ping, you have to specify the port that you're trying to look for, right? So here we're gonna look for SSH. Then, our next to last statement, we would have if your namespace is main, right, then we're going to call main. Questions? So the example that you see on in the notes, you can also use that example. but we can definitely create a file that we can use for multiple type of pinks. And as the author mentioned, right, in a mixed environment, we, you know, when you have Windows, Linux, right, different type of system, Mac OS, we want it to make sure that we can ping different type of systems to check if they're connected. And I think that is uh, one of the questions that's the longest out of all the other questions. So any question with this particular exercise? Okay. So use example on page seven. The only thing that I left out on this one was the main, this last part, okay. Okay, so now 
we will go into. So the next part we're gonna talk about is a tax and then coming back to Ansible. So here it touches on paying a death, right? And you can take a look at, you know, the general information for paying a death. It's been around forever. Um, so it can make it, they can use this as part of, you know, denial of service attack. And if it's coming from multiple sources, it become distributed denial of service attack. But if it's coming from one source, it will just be denial of service. So you can definitely take that system off commission by doing ping of death attack. So in the case where if we're looking at network control, you can test it to see if it sends the host information, any kind of you know, IP length information, version, et cetera. And here is the screenshot of how you can write, right? The um, definition for packet attack. So notice that on this one, they're paying how many times? 60,000 times. So that's definitely a way that you can increase the value here in the parameter to continuously, constantly, right? Um, setting this ping over and over again. So this is just an example of how you would script that. So there are more examples if you visit this website, right? Um, the, they maintain the documentation, so they provide some interactive tutorial for you to, to look at. And it's pretty cool. Um, you can find like, you know, some of the specific example similar to what we talked about and then some different ones there. Okay, so we already talked about how we can scan, we can monitor, we can do these things using Scapy, but now we're gonna move over to the access control list or access list. And access list doesn't have to pertain to user and groups, it really ties to in the network environment, in organization or in the infrastructure, it ties to devices, appliances, right? Um, access list can be on a firewall. It can also be on a switch, a router, um, the appliances that are manageable. So one thing that you, you should know, right? This is important to highlight right here, okay? It says we want to place the access list as close to the source as possible. Inherently, we can also we also trust the inside host and distrust the clients beyond the network boundary, meaning that anything beyond your, you know, your border firewall and your border router is not trustworthy. Okay. Internally, we can say that we trust it most part, but we can implement system like, you know, the, your IPS to inside, right? Any form of detection and prevention system, we can incorporate the inside to really evaluate the trust across our devices, okay? Now it says the access list is therefore usually placed on the inbound direction and on the external facing network interfaces. Okay. So identifying the appliances and the system that's actually storing the access list is important, right? And you know, we wanted to, why do we want to implement that? We want to be able to control who has access to what and how, what kind of level of access that, that we're gonna implement. 
So in the example in the text, it talks about how you, they, they use the nessus to be able to implement the access list. So here, what we can look at is we can look at like the way the traffic is generated across two systems. One is the source, the other is the destination. And we can set up the access list to really evaluate, right? Or to control the services that are generated across these two systems. So if we wanted to deny certain service, we can definitely do that, okay? Or we can permit. And a lot of it is like coming in and leaving, okay? So inbound and outbound and how we control that. Very much um, what you see like with firewall traffic. So we can treat all of these appliances like filter system very much like a firewall. And then we can deny everything else. That means that we're only gonna whitelist certain things or we can accept everything and block certain things. That means that we would create a blacklist of you know, the type of system that we want to block. A lot of the times whitelisting is more effective in access control. So we're gonna use Ansible, which is automating a lot of the things for us because it's task specific and it's reusable it's extensible, all the, the advantages for the, that we touch on in the past. Okay, and with Ansible, you have to have an inventory file where you would list your target systems. And then you would use that to be able to implement, right? Like the example that shows here. When you run the playbook. So here's the playbook. to configure the access list. So to answer the next question, we can simply say, how should you implement the access list on network devices? You would create an inventory file and a playbook using Ansible. And we're almost done. There's just a few more things to cover. So to kind of <clears throat> to kind of zoom in on specific tasks, right? Like for example, we can deny okay a certain type of traffic coming in from this system, right? Or that system. So you can specify the action. You can say deny the protocol and that system. Now you can actually do it for a range of system if you're putting the the, the proper subnet ID, it, it would actually allow you to block a group of systems. And we can do it on network appliances, okay? Like I'm talking routers, switches, okay? Because the security appliances has, um, already has the capability with access control lists, like what you've seen at home, your wireless router has an ACL, right? You can MAC filter, you can block ports. I mean, block connection from a certain system. You can disable ports, etc. Okay. Question? Yeah, I guess. Um, you know, they say some of the attacks occur because of ACL misconfiguration. Mm-hmm. And I guess it would make sense to make a playbook that checks if your ACLs are correctly configured. Yes, on top of what your configuration would be, sure. So, but, you know, security audit is an area that's always deficient because I feel like auditing is after the fact and it's more of a reaction 
thing, right? Yeah. So if you if you want to be, to become proactive about it, then you you would have to check the configuration, use that configuration list to really um, evaluate against what you have in inventory. The challenging part is when you have so many different types of systems and so many systems across like a very large network, then it becomes, you know, a little bit more difficult to manage. So yeah, you can you can automate this so that way, and I would test it and automate it, but you know, the flaw is that it's it's harder to audit it after the fact that's misconfigured. So, so that means that what we have to really think about the policy for inbound and outbound traffic or, you know, what's going on, what's present, um, what's allowed, what's not, right? And some of that comes back to the administrative side. Okay. So on the, here it shows you on how you can take a look at the playbook being used and you can make it a general playbook like what we've seen before. Okay. It's a little bit harder to test this on specific network appliances as we, you know, you, we came across this where we don't have, um, we don't have like, <clears throat> the actual appliances to work with and it's harder to do the simulation because you know we, we saw that it wasn't working in the past but what you can do is if you have like if you have like a, a linksys router you can take a look at how you can manage your linksys router without the interface like write a playbook and test it or even you know um, if you have like a small switch you can even test it that way too so here it talks about MAC access list, and this is how you can MAC filter, okay? So the detail for the task in this is here, it shows you on how you can deny a specific MAC. Okay, so you can specify that. And recall that this is using Linux permission control Right, we talked about that last time where this value is equivalent to what, okay? So here you can permit at this particular map, right? So what you can do is you can specify on the configuration, which is which. So this is part of the playbook and that's only one of the tasks. Then when you finish the playbook with the inventory file, then you can run the playbook. And then we would then use the access list Mac YAML, right? So that's a file. And that basically is what access control or access list management would be on network appliances. Let's talk about syslog, right? I know some of you are in your NCL competition and sometime you would run across logs, right? Logs is the world of cybersecurity, right? Can't get away from it, you know? Um, not very glamorous. This is more of like the granular area, but there are tools that we can use for logs. So there are so many different type of logs, logs from Cisco appliances to other network devices and so on, not just firewall logs, right? Um, or system logs, application logs. There's everything that the system keep track of, we have to evaluate. And that's the job of security, right? Nothing flying through the screen, nothing crazy graphics, right? Like what the movies you normally portray. But understanding the tools that you can use in order to do that is important. So Cisco um, provided information about 
how to identify incidents for their devices. And it's important that you know how to do that, especially when you work with companies that use quite a bit of Cisco or data center that does. So here you, you have access to those links and how access control list is being logged. Now on the side of um, what we see with scripting is we would use regular expression. This allows us to search and kind of sanitize some of the logs or filter down some of the details that we can read, okay? Or the things that we need to look for because you can have a lot of details, a lot of information. So it talks about using regular expression module, which is what you see as RE here. And what lock does for us is it actually gives us the timestamp of the event, right? The incident. And when you do incident response or forensic, this is what you look at, right? When you do security, when you're trying to combat attack, this is what you look at. Logs are our world. So here it shows you, you can import RE and date time. And then what we have is we would have an object called start time. And that's gonna be now. And this shows you on how you can implement the conditions to be able to search and do the FB line. So last semester when I taught CIS 30A during the regular session, right, Sean was highly interested in using the, you know, some of the Python method, built-in method to read this. And elevating that from what we talked about before by looking at read lines, <coughs> we can use this to search. Right, so whatever you're trying to search for, you specify here. And in this case, they're searching for this. ACL log and the, the flow interval for that appliance. And here it shows the elapsed time. And then it shows we wanted to present this in string. And the output of this when you're showing elapsed time is very tiny. Okay. So it shows you the source IP and that's what you're looking for, right? So from here to here, you don't see too much of a difference in the elapsed time. It's like 0 0.04 or close to 0.5 seconds. Okay. I, yes. I don't, this is an indirect question. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. working on GPG uh -huh. and when it prints out, out output, it won't print to a file. I mean, how do you, how do you capture something that doesn't print out to a file? Like That's when pretty. you're a key against the, you know, to see if it's a good signature. That output mm -hmm. that's that signature doesn't go to a file. Can it, does it output like some kind of hash? No, it just outputs to the screen. It's a GPG colon bad signature. And then I tried to put that in a file. It doesn't go into a file. So mm -hmm. how do you, how would you get around something like that? Um, you can, if you are trying to print that, you can probably write it to a file, append it to a file. Mm -hmm do it like a, a pen it to a text file no it, it wouldn't it, uh well it's it's i don't know it, it didn't work when i tried to append it okay i'm not give sure me, give me a screen give me a screenshot of it and let me see um okay from what i know you should be able to append anything to text but it could be that that particular well it depends on how you access the application but so you're just using pretty good privacy that's it p2p yeah, in Linux. Uh huh. Maybe because how how the terminal is accessing it, it's not able to to extract content from it. 
So, um, yeah, I have to check if it's reading okay. and see. Sorry. Okay. No, it's okay. I'll send it to you. Okay. Um, all right. So for this one, if you have a log file already, right, he can access the log file. So you can search through the log file. Um, and all you have to do is set the search criteria. Okay. So see how <clears throat> this is, we're going to see each of these log files. Okay. Both of the files that we're going to look at. Um, you know, I'm just back today and it's just like they bombarded me with email. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> um, and then so we can set the object. So here's the term one is the first. This is the second object. And then we can specify the search for each. Okay. And with the file list, so you don't have to have two, you can have more. Let's say that you have 100 files, 100 log files. You can set up a list and then you can incorporate a for loop to access that list. And then you can read the line and search for a specific line. And this saves so much time, right? If you wanted to make your own tool, but you know, if you use other tools that's out there, open source or commercialized, you see that this is like the, the, the process in how you would read. But this shows you we simply just implement a nested for loop and an if condition and we'll be able to, to find the things that we're searching for. Okay. So if you are, you know, a, a forensic person and you have to go in and look at the network appliances instead of, because, you know, sometimes forensic classes only touches on OS and things like that. It doesn't really dive deep into this, but knowing like, you know, this stuff, it, it gives you leverage in a lot of the areas. And you can do, you know, use this for security reasons. You can use it for pen testing reasons. You can, you know, so many things. Okay. So this is a good example to look at. And this is on page 14. Okay. So I need to kind of wrap things up here. But for 11, um, you would use the regular expression and you can do import RE or you can do import RE comma date, date time, that's fine. That gives you the timestamp. And coming back to the last part in which it talks about UF, uh, UFW, which is used for IP table. And IP table is used by the router, right? Um, it's used to control access for from other routers or other source or the host. And the module that you would use would Ansible to set up IP table rules to filter, right, for IP address is U UFW. Earlier, we talked about MAC address. That's different, right? That's a physical address for that network interface connection point. But UFW uh, pertains to an IP address an IP address is connectionless. And the, the, the appliances that use IP address are routers or switches that could route anything layer three and up. Okay. So just real quick on that and then we'll wrap up. Um, So in other tools, it talks about VLANs and setting up VLANs to separate things. So here is where it touches on UFW. And then you can have it where just like all the other module, OK, you got to install it. OK, and then you can use it. So this is how you would use it. And if you allow, then you can specify what you allow. If you deny. You can you can block it, okay. And then so once you set that, it would show you. Like it would allow, is SSH. It allows HTTP, right? And then for the version six, which is the IPv6, it does the same. So it automates some of that for you, okay. And here, the deny for incoming, allowing for outgoing, disable routed, 
and so on. So what you can do is you can set this up where we can set up an IP table and we can block or we can allow specific ports and specific protocol. Okay. And for the documentation, you can refer to these. Um, I had to look, dig around a little bit because I think the book gave a couple of the outdated um, link, but you can check out some of the example and then, you know, the project in which, you know, it talks about, you know, the exact version of the Python wrapper module. And lastly, I put some information about distributed denial of service, maybe checking out some of the books. There are, you know, additional books on security and there's another class on it, so, okay. Then that class focuses on ethical hacking tactics with, with Python. <laughs> All right, so that wraps up our assignments or our lecture. Um, I will try to post the game and the quiz tonight. And then I will um, post the lab tomorrow. Okay, nothing too long, but I try to make sure that we cover what we didn't get to do last week as well. Okay, any questions? Okay, type your name in the chat if you have it. And have a wonderful afternoon. If you have any questions you want to address separately, I'll stay on for a few more minutes. If not, have a... I'll see you on Wednesday. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Seth. Bye. See you Wednesday, Chris. Ray, you have any questions? No question, Ray? Okay, I'll see you on Wednesday. Okay, if you if you have any questions, please shoot. Oh, there you are. I hear Sorry, you. I left it on mute and I was <laughs> in the restroom. I didn't. I, <laughs> I apologize. Okay, I well, just wanted to see if you have any questions or anything. I usually don't have questions until I get a hold of everything, and right now my computer is apart because I was moving stuff. Why is in my it room. apart? Oh, okay. I I had to tear it apart because I didn't want to hurt it. I didn't want anything to fall. Okay. So it's going to be apart for a little bit longer, but once I get a hold of the code, then I might have some questions to ask. Okay, well, let me know if you have questions, okay? okay. But I will post the video tonight, hopefully. Okay, thank you. All right, you're welcome. See you later. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.